<laughs> good morning. Welcome to Madison United Methodist Church. It's good to have all of you. Oh, you're fine. <laughs> She's walking up. She's home late. No, that's fine. That's good to have you all here today. It's good to see everyone. It's a, it's a beautiful day. I am, uh, it's, it's always nice to wake up and see the sunshine. I, uh, I took a minute after I made my coffee this morning to just kind of look out the window before I started getting into sermon notes and all that as, a, as Sunday morning goes. But it was, it was a nice way to start the day, and this is a great place to be. Let me share with you just a couple of announcements. Um, if you'd like to join the book club, the book they're going to be reading for the summer is The Five Wishes of Mr. Murray McBride by Joe Sipple. And they're going to meet again September 3rd at 5 o'clock to discuss. And all are welcome to join them. So if you have any questions, please see Lindsay Paul. Uh, we are currently updating the calling system. That's the one call. A lot of you have probably, how many of you are getting those? The prayer chain, the, okay. Uh, that is, we're updating that system. If you'd like to be added, uh, either by phone call or by text, please contact the church office. Uh, that number is 304-369-1262. Or you can email mumcsecretary1894 at yahoo.com. Of course, those are in your bulletin, but I've, want to make sure we say them for the benefit of folks watching online. If you, if you do have a prayer request for that phone tree, you can contact Valerie Vickers or you can contact myself, and uh, our numbers are there in the bulletin as well. Uh, there is going to be a retreat for all laity of the West Virginia Conference, and if you're unfamiliar with the word laity, that just means you're not clergy, you're not a pastor. So that's not, I can't come on this thing, but the, uh, the laity retreat for the conference, that's going to be with the bishop uh, August 18th and 19th at, in Summersville uh, at the Arena and Conference Center there. Registration is just $10. Uh, she's going to be doing some teaching, I, I saw it the other day, through parts of the New Testament. It's going to be a pretty exciting thing. Uh, the full agenda is going to be emailed to everyone who registers, and if you need more info, uh, call the church office, 304-369-1262. Uh, Starting to get to where I can say that without looking at it now. And, uh, or, or talk to, I know Heather's going, I think Janet's going. There are probably several others who are interested. So talk to one of them or, or contact us in the office and we will uh, make sure you get all the info you need. I think Kevin has an announcement also. I'm going to let him. Okay, well, we'll go with Kevin and then we'll go with Patty. All right, lady first. <laughs> Good deal. All right. Flowers are taken care of for next week. I'm a stand in for Robin. Uh, if you haven't seen the show Marvelous Marvelettes over Chief Like Wonderettes, sorry. Over <laughs> Chief See there, I told you I was a feeling. Uh, it's a great show. Good, great music, wonderful harmony, humor, uh, 50s music, and like I said, good, good little story in, in, embedded in it. And you will thoroughly enjoy the show. I went and got it. Normally, it's not my kind of thing. But I really liked it. It was good. So if I liked it, I'm sure you guys would thoroughly enjoy it. So go see it. It's a good show. And this is the last night. It starts at 8.30 is when the show starts. Where is it? It's at Chief Logan State Park in the amphitheater. <laughs> Kevin, man, I know all about having your wife throw you details in the middle. Heather's done that to me, too, on announcements and stuff. So it's good to have folks who can help keep us in line. And between, uh, between my wife when I'm not here and Patty when I am here, I've got good help to keep me, uh, keep me going the way I need to go. So you could have, hey, that's, that's fine. That's, that's absolutely true. I wouldn't say it if it weren't. Man. Are there any other announcements before we move ahead? Oh, yeah. Yeah, garden-grown fresh food, fresh vegetables and things out here from James and Willow in the, uh, in the narthex. Is this what we call this? The narthex? The, there are so many names for parts of churches, y'all. You just have to be patient with me. They're out here. And uh, so if you'd like some, get some. They're out there at the end of the service. Yeah. Good deal. Anyone else? Announcements? 
All right, uh, Tom, I'm going to ask if you'll come and there he is over there. I'm going to say I lost track of him and, uh, and open us with a word of prayer this morning. Let's pray. Our most righteous and loving Heavenly Father, we gather in your presence today to worship you with praise and thanksgiving, for you are worthy of our praise and worthy of our thanks. We pray, come Holy Spirit, come in your strength and your power, come in your own gentle way. Come as a wisdom to children, come as new sight to the blind, come Lord, in your own gentle way. This morning, Father, we pray for unity of hearts and minds. We pray, Heavenly Father, for that same unity that Christ prayed for in John chapter 17. As he prayed that we might be one with each other, even as, and one with Christ, as Christ and the Father are one. Lord, bind our hearts together as one today, and we, we come with uh, uh, our hearts, uh, Lord, focused on you that we might worship you in spirit and truth. Hear our prayers. Bless our pastor, Lord, as he'll bring the message this morning, the choirs he'll sing, the prayers and prayer concerns that will be offered. Hear our prayer. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 529? Yeah. Uh, let's stand. We're going to sing How Firm a Foundation, 529. to be thankful for, isn't it? No matter what comes at us, no matter what tries to shake us, that God is never going to forsake us. I think there's a lot of hope to be found there. 
And I'll tell you, in a world that is kind of tired on trying to give you much actual hope, those are the things you hang on to. Stuff I hang on to every day. I wonder, before I start rambling down another rabbit hole, if there might be a testimony this morning. We got several. Microphone is coming around. This is really a proud mother moment. Um, my daughter Hannah is on her way to Honduras today for a mission trip with eight others from the Fairfax United Methodist Church. Oh, and wow. I think this is the fifth year that she's gone there. That's awesome. We'll be praying she has a good trip. It's got one in the back there, Allison. Thank you. I'm not sure if the church remembers, but back in March, I had asked for prayer for my neighbor um, in Florida. He's from Greece, 83 years old. He went to see his sister who was um, not doing very well. He really didn't want to travel, but he did. And shortly after he got there, he was diagnosed with COVID. And he, with a lot of prayers. He was in the hospital and did not get very good care um, in Greece. And um, he went to rehab. He was in and out of the hospital, rehab back to the hospital on the ventilator four times. But he made it home recently and I got to see him. And when I walked in the door, he kept saying, praise God, praise God, and crying. And he said, I want you to tell this message to everybody you know that's ever sought medical care in the United States of America. He said other countries speak of how cheap they can get their medical care at 15 and 18 dollars. And he said, I'm from Greece. I grew up in Greece. I came to America in the 60s. But I was treated terribly. God bless America. God bless the physicians. And he wanted me to thank everyone who had prayed for him. And it was, it was the biggest blessing. I have a second blessing. Thank goodness for my husband and Benadryl because I had a severe reaction to amoxicillin on Friday and could have turned out really bad. But I, I give praise that he was with me and for the easy drug of Benadryl. But um, thank you all for your prayers for Jimmy. I'm just so grateful that he's, he's doing well. Amen. Someone else. Uh, as some of you know, this past week, uh, the criminal hearing was held at the magistrate court for the young lady that kicked in our church door. And at the end of the proceeding, uh, the young lady was asked by the judge uh, why she did it. And her words were, her response was spiritual awakening. And those words have kind of resonated with me, obviously, through the week, and uh, I just feel compelled to share this with you. In my heart, I, I feel like there are some people who uh, maybe rely on church membership or maybe, uh, you know, the fact that your mother or grandmother had attended a church, not necessarily this one, but a church for a number of years or maybe been in the church 10,000 or more times, but that doesn't get us into heaven. It's that personal relationship with Jesus Christ that gets us into heaven. Right. And so I, I felt compelled to share that with you. But the thing is, you know, and, and you know, Robert and I had a nice long discussion uh, before the proceeding. Um, keep this in mind, too, that literally the molecule that holds each of us together, when you unravel it under an electron microscope, looks like a cross. And when you take a breath and exhale, the sound that you make in Hebrew is God's name. So, you know, in addition to the, the physical proof that we have, you know, the encounters that we make every day, uh, the people in this church, uh, you know, I love every single one of you and because you're my brother or sister in Christ. But if there's anybody within the sound of my voice that hasn't said, Jesus, I need you, don't be deceived by the enemy. That's what it takes to get into heaven. And I just felt compared to share that with you. Absolutely. Thank you. Amen. Absolutely right. There's a whole sermon around that molecule thing I'll share with you guys sometime. Victor and I talked a while about that. But, cool. but what it essentially is, is I mean, that means that you're marked billions of times over with the cross on you. And you'll never meet somebody who Jesus didn't go to the cross for. But you've got to go there yourself to accept that gift. It's right on, man. 
others this morning. All right, I think I'm going to ask Jerry to come and share our scripture reading this morning. This is the reading of Psalm 139. It is a psalm of David. It's one of the great, I think, writings in the scripture. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I stand. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You know when I go in and when I lie down. You're familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and in front, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too great for me. It's too lofty for me to understand. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths of the sea, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, or if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me, and your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light become night around me, but even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like day, for darkness is as nothing to you. For you created me. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am carefully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame is not hidden from you. When I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. And all the days ordained for me were written in your book before any of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand on the sea. When I awake, I am still with you. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. This is the word of God to the people of God. of prayer, I want to ask if there are any prayer requests this morning you would like to share. <coughs> James is uh, a little over a week away from the surgery on his cornea. We want to remember that. We'll be having prayer for him again next week, too. He's already asked us about that. We will do that. Glenn Evans, who is a retired Methodist minister, started the school in Honduras that Hannah goes to every year. Um, his 21-year-old grand, grandson died on um, Friday. Hmm. We'll certainly be praying. Yeah, come on up, John. Just what I wanted to, it, this is a, a, a prayer of thanksgiving and a prayer of praise, but when I look around the church this morning, there's so many people that have been off for such a long time that have shown up that, you know, dealing with health issues, so it's, it's a blessing for all of you to be here and continue prayers for continued improvement.
Anyone else? All right. Well, let's pause for a time of prayer together. Lord, as we come this morning, we are first thankful to be here in your house and here with one another. Lord, we feel your spirit in this place already today. Lord, we're also thankful for the words we've heard from the scripture and the words that have been shared in testimonies earlier, Lord, of your goodness and the, the places where we've seen you moving. Lord, we're thankful that when we look at ourselves, even down to our smallest level, that we still find a cross on us, Lord, that you have marked us as yours in that great gift that you have given. We're thankful to see so many here today. Lord, we're thankful, as we heard in the scripture reading earlier, that, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Lord, that you understand who we are. You know our frame, it says. Lord, we can't go anywhere where your presence is not already there. Lord, I'm so thankful, so grateful for that today. Lord, we do come with our requests. We think of James with his eye surgery coming up. and Lord, we ask that you would give him a spirit of peace as this approaches. Lord, that you would begin already to be working the hands and the minds of the doctors and the, the nurses, everyone involved in that surgery and in his care. And, Lord, that you would surround him with your healing power and presence as this approaches. And, Lord, that this surgery would be a vehicle of your healing grace. Lord, we think of Glenn, who lost his grandson uh, just in the last few days, just 21 years old. And, and, Lord, those are the times that sometimes we look at you and we don't understand why something has happened. We don't understand what has happened. And Lord, in the, in the midst of all of the, the grief, as rough as it is, there are still all of those unanswered questions that just seem to magnify things. And so, Lord, into that situation, we pray that you would interject your peace and your comfort. Lord, that you would reach in with your spirit and that you would just be so close there that it is unmistakable to this gentleman and to his family that you are walking right alongside them. Lord, throw your arm around them and pull them in. Comfort them in their grief, in their pain. Lord, we're thankful to see the folks here who maybe haven't been able to be here for a while because of health issues. And Lord, we do continue to, to lift those folks to you and ask that you would continue to, to help them to, to get better. Lord, continue to cover them with your healing power. Lord, we think of folks whom we've visited over the last couple of weeks who aren't able to make it today. And Lord, we ask that you would touch them as well and that you would be with them right where they are. Lord, that you would remind them that even though they may not be able to be here in the building with us, that they are not outside of your presence. Lord, surround them today. And Lord, we think of this young woman who kicked the window in. And Lord, having seen her earlier this week and, and heard some of the things she said and, and knowing the state she may have been in, and, and Lord, may still be in. Lord, we pray that you would touch her. We pray that you would deliver her from the things that are, are keeping her captive to this life that she's not supposed to be living. Lord, we pray that you would cover her with your grace and that you would draw her, if not here to this church, Lord, to a place where she will hear your word and respond. Lord, I firmly believe and, and have seen it in my own life at, at times that I'm not proud of that there is no one that's outside of the reach of your grace. Lord, that includes this young woman. We lift her to you this morning as well. I ask that you would just turn her life upside down in all the best ways. Lord, be with us in the rest of the service this morning. Be with me as I preach. Lord, that the message would be yours entirely and that we would find the word opened and illuminated, Lord, because of your movement and your presence. Lord, not because of me, but Lord, because of you. Bless us and keep us today, we pray. We commit the entire service to you and ask it in the name of Christ, our Lord. And Lord, we ask that you would draw us together as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If the ushers would uh, 
move into place. We will continue our worship with the giving of our tithes and our offerings.
this winding road. Bless the givers. Bless those who are unable to give. Lord, we know all things that we have come of you. And we have given you a voice. We ask it all in the name of Christ. Come and listen in to a radio station where the mighty host of heaven sing. Turn your radio on. Turn your radio on. If you want to feel those good vibrations come from the joy that his love can bring. Turn your radio on. Turn your radio on. with God. Turn your radio on. Well, don't you know that everybody is a radio receiver? All you have to do is listen for the call. Turn your radio on. Turn your radio on. If you listen in, you will be a believer. Leading on the truth that would never fall Get in touch with God Turn your radio on Turn your radio on And listen to the music in the air Turn your radio on Heaven's glory share Turn your lights down low And listen to the masters of radio Get in touch with God, turn your radio stand one more time. We'll join in one more hymn uh, before the message. This is number 128, He Leadeth Me.
Amen. You may be seated. I think I probably say that every week, but it's true. I enjoyed the choir this morning. John, you did an awesome job, man. Great solo. I don't know where you disappeared to. <laughs> I've lost track of where everyone sits. And sometimes, like, this is unrelated to the sermon totally. There were, there were probably 80% of the people in the two churches I pastored in Elkview that you knew whether they were there or not by looking to one specific seat in the sanctuary. Because if they weren't there, they weren't somewhere else. They were just not in the building. And I know it's, it's totally fine to get in a routine. It is not a problem to sit in the same place every Sunday. But I haven't learned where y'all sit yet. So, like, I just found John as I was telling that story back there. <laughs> yeah, everybody switch places next week. I won't know who anyone is. That's what's going to If you have a Bible with you, I'm going to invite you to turn over to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13. We're going to pick up in there in just a minute. And I don't know how this has happened, but I got a little off center. Let's fix that. That's going to bother me. Now, Matthew 13 today, we're looking at one of the parables of Jesus, and this is in a long stretch of, of several of them. We're going to look at one of them. When you hear the word parable, what do you think of? Stories. That's the easiest answer, number one. Stories, lessons, sometimes fables kind of do the same thing, a story that, that teaches what we're, teaches something else. That's kind of what captures what a parable is. At their simplest, that's what they are. They're a story that teaches sort of a basic lesson, often something moral, whether or not it's in the Bible or not, when you run up on other fables. But not always, not always moral, sometimes just practical. Like, what's the lesson if I asked you about the tortoise and the hare? Okay, slow and steady wins the race, but what's that mean? You know, I mean, we can repeat that thing, but that one's more about persistence and that it's important to, to do things because you're going to be moving forward as you go, even if it's slower. That story is not about turtles being faster than rabbits, right? So parables are always telling something that is below the surface. It's always something there. That's, that's an important thing. A lot of the time, when Jesus tells a parable, they are encouraging, they are uplifting, not always, but most of the time. Usually something that you kind of look at and go, yeah, I can see myself in that story somewhere. Like in the, in the story of the prodigal son, we've all been that prodigal at some point. We've probably been the older brother at some point who, even after we came back as the prodigal ourselves and got it right, then we get a little, we get a little comfortable and feel like, well, that, that person, I, I know how they've been. Maybe they shouldn't come back. Or we've never celebrated when I got things right. You know, we've all been that guy. Our call in that story ultimately is to be the father who welcomes people in. But we see ourselves in different places in those parables. What do we do when a parable's not easy? It's a little harder, isn't it? Because the parable we're going to look at today is not a simple, easy one. And on the surface, it's, it's not terribly encouraging. It's not terribly uplifting. And when you come right down to it, this one's a little confusing. So we're turning to one of those. It's a story that Jesus tells that might sound harsh at first. But when we start to break it down and see what it is, and we bring the rest of the scripture in to look at it that way, then there's really an important lesson about how we live, an important lesson about a decision to be made if we've never made it, an important lesson about hope in Christ. So we're going to look here for a minute. Now I'm going to read this in two chunks. You can probably see it up here. Uh, verses 24 through 30, and then I'm going to jump over to verses 36 through 43. The reason I am doing that, because I'm not typically someone who skips around on a sermon text, is because in between there is another parable that's wedged in here, and we're going to talk about that parable on another Sunday in the next few weeks. So I'm going to leap over it for now, and we will come back to it uh, before, the end, uh, before the end of August, at least. Anyway, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, beginning at verse 24. The Scripture says this, He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. 
So the servants said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now jumping down to verse 36. It says, Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. And he answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of the Father. He who has ears, let him hear. Sort of a tough place to... To finish, isn't it? We're going to break this down in a minute. Let's pause for a word of prayer and then we'll get in here. Lord, as we open the word to what feels a little tough, feels a little confusing in places, why is this any kind of encouragement? Lots of questions that can surround this, Lord. But Lord, as we come, we pray that it is you that would illuminate this for us. Lord, that the, the message that I bring would be only what you've given me. Lord, that you would be glorified here, and that despite the, the, the tough nature of this, that we would leave encouraged. Lord, speak to us through the word, speak to us through your spirit, and we commit this service and this message entirely to you for your glory alone, and we ask it in the name of Christ. Amen. So parables are interesting. So, I mean, they go all directions, but they are interesting. They're not the sort of thing where you can just hear the story and go, well, okay, the lesson is do this, not that, right? I mean, sometimes they are on a basic level, but it's really hard to teach the depth of a parable and just break it down to do this, don't do this. I mean, on some level, a lot of parables can be read that way, but really, unless this lesson is don't sow weeds into the field of some guy you don't like, it's not really the lesson here today, right? So this is one of those places where the scripture picks up right in the middle of something that Jesus is already teaching, as so often happens when we jump in in the middle of a chapter. Jesus has already been telling some stories. In fact, this is not the first parable in this chapter. It's really not even the first parable in the last five or six minutes of whatever Jesus has been doing. In fact, the one he told right before this was a different one about seeds and a sower. But it doesn't work out exactly the same way. That one talks about where the seeds land. How they grow is different based on where the seeds have taken root, where they've ended up. Because in that one, they're all thrown around by the same sower. But the next one that Jesus tells is this one. This time, it's the seed, not the ground, that is different. And Jesus tells that story. The sower has sowed good seed. The enemy comes at night, sows some weeds, should we pull them? No, because you'll accidentally pull the good ones. Leave them to the harvest, and we'll separate them, and then pull the good ones into the barn. And you realize that Jesus finishes that story and just moves on? I mean, we jumped ahead a little bit to get to the explanation, but Jesus tells a, another short parable about mustard seed and leaven, and, and the way we get this, you know, it's after all of these things, he leaves the crowds. We understand that Jesus has been doing other stuff. He's been teaching parables, but he's with this crowd, this is not like five minutes later the disciples get the explanation. They've probably had to live with this a good bit of the day. He's immediately telling that other story, and then they go on to do other stuff. And so you have to think at the very first hearing of this that the disciples might not have connected just exactly what it was that Jesus was talking about. It's just sort of a weird story about wheat and weeds. And right before that, we already heard about a sower and seeds. And right after this, it's mustard seeds. Maybe it's agriculture day with Jesus. Not so much, but it can feel that way. Because then Jesus explains. And what's so cool about this is they, they get in the house with him and come to him and say, could you explain this thing that you've said? You know, that didn't happen when they were out in the middle of everything else. That happened when they got alone with Jesus. 
It's not in my sermon notes, but I think it's an important thing. Y'all, if you want deeper understanding, if you want to sit with this and understand more of what's in here, if you want to have a closer walk with Jesus, you got to go in the house with him. you got to go spend some time with him. Sometimes you just got to go up to Jesus and go, Lord, I don't understand this. I need your help here. It's exactly what the disciples did. And you know what? They walked very closely with him. That is our call. Our call is not to just be people who follow way far back here. We are called to be disciples and to make disciples. So we need to spend some time in the house with Jesus. That's a bonus. He goes and explains the whole thing. The sower is the son of man, the fields of the world, seeds are people. Some of them are growing as the sower intended. Some of them were sown by the enemy. That's a little sobering, isn't it? Do you realize that each of these plants we're talking about, wheats or weeds, our people, it's a little sobering. I've heard people talk about being good people. Have you heard that? I'm a good person. I don't need, to, I don't need Jesus. I don't need religion. I don't, I'm a good person. I'm a good person. The trouble is, is that this parable makes it pretty clear that each of us has got a sower and there are only two options. And if you're not following Jesus, then you need to see who your gardener is. Because it might have been sown by someone else. And I'll go you one better than that. In a lot of this field, the wheat and the weeds are growing right next to each other because it came all the way until harvest time before they said, oh, look, there are weeds in the middle of the wheat. And I'll tell you how they could do that later. But right now, you just have to know, they didn't even notice it until the harvest because they were all growing in there together, which means that in every single part of the field, which is the world, you're going to have good seed, good wheat growing right next to things that are weeds. And if we're talking about the whole world, we're talking about the church. There are times there's some weeds in the church. Our job is to not be a weed. And I will say, as I'm talking about this, know that if you're afraid you're a weed, or if you're already afraid you're a weed, you're probably not. Because you're trying to get things right with Jesus. But just know, weeds are not hopeless in this case. So before I get all the way down this road, you have to know there's hope here, even for the weeds. We know how the end of the parable goes. They're going to grow. They'll be separated at the end. And you say, well, how how does this happen in the first place? Doesn't Jesus know what's going on in his field? Well, sure he does. He didn't blame the servants when there were weeds in there, which he could have. And probably when you go to like first century agriculture, this is true. I mean, if there was something that went wrong in a field, it's probably the servant's fault. Or at the very least, the servants were going to be punished for it because the landowner would have sown the stuff and then, leave, then had the servants tend to that field until he came back and checked on it. Does that sound like anything that you might be familiar with? I mean, Jesus may have came and sown a lot of seeds and then he went to the Father and he's watching, but we tend this place until he comes back. So he could have blamed the servants. Well, obviously you messed this up somehow. No, he says an enemy has done this. He knows exactly what's happened in his field. And really, that's kind of how it all started at the beginning anyway. God plants this garden. It's beautiful. He puts people in it. It's it's glorious. It's exactly as it ought to be. An enemy came. Some fruit was eaten. Some seed was sown. Suddenly, there were weeds and thistles and thorns. and wasn't quite as it was supposed to be. It still didn't stop the hope. In fact, God promised one soon after that, and I'm going to end up on another sermon if I follow down that road. But he knows his servants haven't messed this up. It's not random circumstances. It's, not, it, it's an enemy. And this is where the details are really important because the sower sows the seed. Good seed is sown during the day. So when is the weed sown? At night? That's right, but you know it doesn't just say night. Look closely at that passage, because over here, it's in verse, we're coming out of verse 24, you know, the, the men were sleeping, but in verse 25, but he sowed good seed in his field, but while his men were sleeping, an enemy came and sown weeds. Sleep is one of those really important words in the scripture, that especially when we run up on it in a parable, where everything kind of equates to something else, you have to pay attention to it. Because it doesn't just mean rest. And most of the time in a parable like this, it doesn't mean rest. When Jesus is telling his disciples in Mark chapter 13 to watch for the Son of Man might return in an hour that you might expect, what does he say to them? Do not be caught sleeping. 
1 Thessalonians 5, Paul says, Let us not sleep as others do, but let us be awake and to be sober. And in fact, in another place in that passage, he says, We are not children of sleep or children of the night. We're not talking about you don't go to sleep at night. We're talking about spiritual things, awareness, care, a spiritual life that is getting stronger. And so we're talking about sleep. We're talking about a lack of all of those things. A lack of awareness, a lack of care, an apathy, if you will. Spiritual carelessness. Those seeds from the enemy can only come in if we are not aware enough to stop them. Because we can take this to another level and say sometimes this wheat and weeds thing is more than just people, it's our hearts. It's what, what's happening in there too. And if we are not awake and we are not aware, then there are seeds that come in when we are not paying attention and we might not see them until they grow high enough for us to tell the difference. And by then, they've got roots. A little harder to pluck out after that. Now, it's okay to get into a routine in our spiritual lives that is good, that is comfortable and helpful. I'm not talking about not, you know, that you always have to be shaking things up and spending 10 hours a day in prayer. And I, I don't mean all that. And no, I don't spend 10 hours a day in prayer. It's, uh, I mean, that would be amazing, but uh, there's no way. I'm, I'm not there. It's okay to be in a place in our life, in our spiritual lives, where we have routines of life and work and prayer and reading, finding those ways that we connect best. I mean, for some folks, that's going and spending an hour in, in deep devotions. For other folks, that's a half hour on your back porch with a cup of coffee in the morning talking to God. You know what I mean? That can look very different for everybody, but you got to find those places where you connect best and deepest because then our comfort doesn't become complacency. Because when we get to complacency, our guard is not up. And when there is no spiritual guard, there's nothing blocking the way for the enemy to come in and sow seeds that shouldn't be there. We might not even see him do it. And so then there's the surprise when we find weeds among the weeds. So what about the weeds? How do we handle those? It's really a problematic question the way I wrote it because we don't handle them. We don't uproot them. Scripture says that. Because if it, well, let's be honest, if there were people in the church that you thought were weeds, the job is not to uproot them and kick them out of the church because you're going to damage other people as well. And weeds are not hopeless propositions in God's kingdom. So our job is not to uproot them could do more harm than good. They've got to be allowed to grow. It's probably not news to anybody that any church that's full of good weed is going to have a few weeds. We can't be in the business of trying to pluck out those weeds ourselves. We can't. It is never our job because it'll harm the weed as well. And I would conjecture that second reason is that no one is beyond hope in God's eyes. Because you see, none of us have ever been at... How many of you have ever gardened? Let me try this. How many of you have ever mowed your lawn and had to go get a weed eater? All right. How many of you have ever been able to take a weed and turn it into something else? Uh-huh. Yeah, we can't. If we've got weeds in our yard, then we come back with a weed eater and cut and chop them down, or we come back with a bottle full of Roundup and we take care of the problem a little more permanently, don't we? Yeah, because in our yards, in our fields, as it were, around our houses, our, a weed is just a weed. It's a pest. It's annoying. It's taking away from what the rest of the yard is doing. It doesn't look as, as put together. And if you're somebody who takes pride in how your lawn looks, that one weed over there is really going to bother you, Right? Of course it is, so we deal with it. But here's the thing, is when we get into this field that Jesus is talking about in this parable, we can't go plucking the weeds out. You know why? It's not our field. Is it? We didn't sow the seeds there. It's not our lawn. It's the field we're growing in. We don't know in the field. It's not our field. We didn't put the seed there. The sower, the gardener, God put the seeds there in the first place. It's not ours to go trying to pluck the weeds out. It's the field we're growing in. It's the sower's field. Two more points as I, as I wind down. I'm going to come back to that one for a minute, in a minute. And here's the deal when we're talking about how these things can come up and we don't know that they're there until... You know, harvest time, essentially, until everything's mature. 
I don't know if any of you have ever grown wheat. I have not grown wheat. I did live in Kansas for a couple of years, which means I've seen enough wheat to last my entire life. There, it's everywhere. You get outside of a town, you have wheat fields. I'm not even joking, wheat fields for miles. I mean, it is what makes up Kansas. When you hear the America the Beautiful song and it talks about amber waves of grain, if you get into a place like Kansas, Nebraska, parts of Oklahoma, and a good breeze takes off over those wheat fields when they're tall, it looks like ocean waves. I mean, they're out there for miles. I've never grown the stuff, but I've seen the stuff. But when wheat grows, when it gets tall, when it all comes there together, even with those weeds alongside it, first of all, the weeds look almost exactly the same. So they're very hard to distinguish from one another. But when the wheat gets mature, the head of it bows. The weeds don't do that. They bow. I think my question is, as we become more mature, are you bowing? I'm not talking about in a way that everyone else sees for us. Not, an outward thing, not outwardly, but inwardly. Not a bow of the head, but a bow of the heart. Not something that everyone is looking at, but something that you are in the presence of God and you're bowing in reverence because you understand where you are. Wheat will bow when it is mature at the top. The weeds do not. And so we don't uproot the others, but we encourage them to grow in humble reverence to the one who sows the good seed. Because here's the other thing. We might not be able to change the weeds that show up in our yard, but God can sure turn a stock of weed into a stock of wheat. Because he's done it for each and every one of us. And don't kid yourself, if you've been following Christ for a long time, do not ever forget that you were a weed before you were wheat. And that is how redemption works. Why? You say, well, we sowed, the enemy sowed seeds, so of course that was going to grow to be weed. Yeah, okay, well, maybe. But if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. I don't care what seed you came from. If you come to Christ, then all things have become new. God's got a way of taking the, the most messed up weeds you've ever seen that are choking everything else out and turning them into wheat that can then be harvested. You know what happens when you harvest wheat and you use it for something else? You start feeding other people with it. The wheat that is grown multiplies. God starts to nourish the kingdom with the things that have grown. So if you think somebody isn't growing quite right or they initially came to wherever you were into your life because the enemy was trying to use them to mess up everybody else, maybe you don't think they're bowing the right way. It might not be our job to uproot them, but it is our job to pray for God's transforming power. Because folks, we did not all start out as wheat. We know that. And those who have not met him yet still need that transformation. Our job is to nurture them, to allow them to grow, to give them what they need to grow so that when they, become, they begin to mature and they begin to see what they should be, that they bow to the one who sows the good seed. I don't feel like I've preached quite as long this morning. Maybe I have. I have no watch. I have no clock. That's a dangerous thing for a pastor. But I'm coming down to the end of what I wrote. I would just say this. As we take a minute right before the closing hymn here, I'm thinking of the scripture that Jerry read earlier, and I'm thinking of how we're looking at all of this. And I think we'd take a minute and examine yourself and ask God to examine you. Search me, O oh God, wasn't it? Know my heart and see if there be anything in me that shouldn't be there. How's that old hymn go at the end? Guide me in every step. Set me free. If you're struggling with this thing, maybe you don't feel like you're growing as you should be. Maybe you're afraid your seed wasn't good in the first place. Or maybe you just know, I've never come into that relationship with Jesus. I've been here alongside everybody else. And I know there's a lot of good weed here, but you know, I've never made that commitment. So at the heart, I'm still a weed. Well, I've got a gardener who can change that for you. And the thing is, is that he doesn't hold that back from anybody. You will never meet somebody that Jesus didn't go to the cross for. And you cannot possibly be someone that Jesus didn't die for. Like, it just isn't possible. You can't go too far and do too much to get outside of the reach of his grace. So if you see a lot of other wheat around and you know you've never made that transforming commitment to him, he's still absolutely willing to transform you.
right now. Like you don't have to do 50 things and try to make yourself look more like wheat before you come. You just come. He'll help you with that. Take a minute for self-examination as we, as we prepare to sing. Ask God to show you if there are things in your life that should not be. Because he will. Which might be a little uncomfortable for just a minute, but know that when he shows you that stuff, it's so you can give it right back to him. That's grace. Because he loves you. He wants you to grow deeper with him, to sink your roots where they should be, to grow tall and then to bow before him. Folks, if there's anything in you that shouldn't be there, you lay it down today. If you need to pray, you come up, I will be right there with you. And the thing is, even if I wasn't there, you wouldn't be alone because Jesus is already here. If you come to pray and I pray with you, Jesus meets us. But you won't be coming alone. So you come if you have need as we sing. Stand if you would. God is good all the time. Let's close with our benediction. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds and the knowledge of the love of God the Father and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain in you now and always. Amen.